الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Professor Dr. Khalid Ahmad, Major General Muhammadu Buhari, organizers of this second World Conference on Riba, a word which is located in the Quran. And so it is to the Quran we'll have to go for the meaning of that word. Presenters, delegates, brothers and sisters here in Putra World Trade Center in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Surah Al Baqarah of the Quran and the word of Allah Most High. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الذين يأكلون الربا those who consume riba they better listen لا يقومون إلا كما يقوم الذي يتقبته الشيطان من المص they will not stand they will not conduct themselves they will not behave except in a very strange way, on Judgment Day, and here also in this world, except as a people driven to madness by Satan's touch. Just open your eyes and you can see how they're behaving now. The barbarians who now rule the world. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا This is because they say, they claim, إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الْرِبَى That all that we're doing is conducting business. The lending money on interest, we who belong to the Jamaat of Shylock, we're just doing business. No, says Allah to Shairah and to all his followers in the world today. Innama al bayr mislu riba. Business. Riba is a form of business. No, says Allah. Wa ahallallah al bayr. Allah has made business halal. وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَى And Allah has made riba haram. And so the alternative to riba is not Islamic banking. The alternative to riba is business. And Islam insists that business must take place in a free and a fair market. That's all. That's all that Islam has ever offered to the world. A free and a fair market. Our topic, the menacing role of riba in contemporary socio-political and economic events 
Biden. The current mysterious Arab uprisings, like the imminent demise of the US dollar, last heard of in some ICU in a hospital in Manhattan, <coughs> like the likelihood this year or maybe next year of Israel making her long planned moves to wage big wars. Wars which will eventually deliver to Israel rule over the world. These political and economic social events that our daughters in Indonesia are now slaves in Singapore, working from morning to night, day after day, no holidays, and in that model state, at the end of the month, they pay the slave of a wage, the, the, the wage of a slave, excuse me. These mysterious political, economic, and social events unfolding in the world are linked to riba, and hence we need to define riba. Thanks to the fact that you took more time to drink your coffee than you should have, my time is now reduced to half an hour. <laughs> Allah speaks in the Quran, excuse me, and gives us a definition of riba which we can expand in the rest of today and tomorrow. But it is one form of riba is lending money on interest. <laughs> Hence, we have to now define what is money. Lending money on interest. And I have this little book, it's just about 60 pages long. So there's no excuse for not reading. The gold dinar and silver dirham, Islam and the future of money. In which I've attempted to define what is money from the Quran. The Dajjal, of course, has a different definition. Oh, you know who is Dajjal? The one who seeks to impersonate the true Messiah. Well, welcome to Islamic eschatology. <laughs> that Allah promised Banu Israel that he will send one who would be the Messiah, a prophet, and who would rule the world from Jerusalem. Like David alayhi salam and Solomon alayhi salam from the holy state of Israel. And when Allah sent the Messiah, some of them accepted, but the rabbis rejected because they said he was a bastard. And then when they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, oh, he could not have been the Messiah. He's dead. Never rule the world. But you and I know that in the Quran, Allah has explained, no, they did not kill him, they did not crucify him. Allah raised him, and one day he's coming back. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. Christians and Muslims are the only two people in the world who believe that he will return, and he will rule the world. And Christians and Muslims are the only two people in the world who believe Allah created someone and programmed him to impersonate that true Messiah. And therefore he will have to rule the world. And he's well on his way to ruling the world today. He has to impose a political and economic dictatorship upon all of mankind. And you cannot understand events unfolding in the world of politics today, in the world of economics today, in the world of monetary economics today, without that eschatological perspective of a tomorrow which lies probably 25, 30 years from today, when a man will stand up in Jerusalem, Prophet Muhammad 
Allah's blessings be upon him described that man to us 1400 years ago. Al-Masih al-Dajjal, the Antichrist, the false messiah. And he will proclaim from Jerusalem, I am the Messiah, which is why Israel has to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world. The Quran has explained to us the riba which he is going to use as the most dangerous of all weapons in his stock to establish that political and economic dictatorship upon mankind. And the Quran defines riba for us and defines what is money for us. Why is it prohibited to lend money on interest? We have a lot of time today and tomorrow to expand on that subject. But when he says Allah has made business halal and riba haram, He's saying to us that a riba transaction is not a business transaction. Because a business transaction involves the assumption of risk. You can make a profit or you can suffer loss. But the money lender wants to immunize himself from loss. And so come rain or come sunshine, I'll get my pound of flesh. And they've gotten a lot of the flesh of, of Africa already. They've gotten a lot of the flesh of Bangladesh and Pakistan and Egypt and Indonesia already. And the more flesh they eat, the closer are we to that slavery with which history is now ending. No, this is not business. This is not a fair market where a money lender is allowed to lend money on interest. And so money would grow over time, no sweat. But there's another form of riba. Uh, before we turn to that, thank you John Perkins, thank you for confessions of an economic hitman. <laughs> we suspected it, we talked about it, but before John Perkins wrote that book, they wouldn't believe us. The money lender sometimes lends you money, not because he wants to become rich at your expense, but that Major General Buhari very well understood. He lends you money because he wants to enslave you. And that's what they did. But that's not the only form of riba. There's another form as well. Let me first present to you the elegant explanation. A transaction based on deception, which yields a profit or a gain or an advantage to which one is not justly entitled. That's the elegant way of explaining what the Americans beautifully describe as a ripoff. <laughs> a ripoff. And the biggest ripoff in human history is the ripoff of modern paper and electronic currency, money. You take a piece of paper and Imran Hussein has studied international monetary economics at two universities, so he does have a little bit of knowledge of the subject. You take a piece of paper, you print a pic picture on it, and you put a number on it, and then you assign to that piece of paper an entirely fictitious value. Not in Islam. No, sir. In Islam, money has intrinsic value stock, period, full stop. There are no two opinions on this, because this is the Quran. 
Money has intrinsic value. The value of the money is in the money. Bata has its benefits. Community money has its benefits and we probably are already using that in Indonesia today. And we, need, we would be happy to hear what you have to say on these subjects, on the use of barter, the use of community money. But money in Islam has intrinsic value, meaning the value of the money is in the money. Number two, that it is Allah and Allah alone who creates wealth out of nothing. When gold and silver coins are in short supply in the market, and gold coins are in the Quran, and silver coins are in the Quran, and this is supposed to be an Islamic conference. And so from this conference emerges the viewpoint of Islam. When gold and silver coins are in short supply in the market, then we use commodities of food supply which are in an abundant supply in the market which have a shelf life and with value created by Allah and not by the Bank of England and so the Prophet said Allah's blessing be upon him and you've heard it so many times. He said gold for gold, silver for silver, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, dates for dates, salt for salt. Six things, two of them precious metals and the other four are commodities of food supply. <coughs> and so it is not by accident that Allah gave to the island of Java so much rice. And he didn't give you all that rice just to eat it, no. If you have a short supply of gold and silver coins in Java and you want to bring back money which is in the Quran and Sunnah, you'd use rice as money. You'd monetize your rice. You won't sell your rice for this bogus, fraudulent and utterly haram paper money and electronic money. Paper money, electronic money, created out of thin air, is bogus, is fraudulent, is fraud. <coughs> Fractional reserve banking, where you create wealth out of thin air, is bogus, is fraudulent, is haram, is a system of legalized theft. <laughs> and the alternative is supposed to be Islamic banking. Credit transactions are permissible in Islam. I'll just touch on the subjects before we have the whole of today and tomorrow. Credit transactions are permissible in Islam. The Prophet himself bought on credit. But there is no evidence. And it's a little late now to manufacture evidence. The credit price can be higher than cash price. No. If credit price is higher than cash price, the difference between the two would be because of time. Money can increase over time. That's riba. When Islamic banks offer us something that they call murabaha, but it's not murabaha. They are selling on credit at a price higher than the cash price. And when we say to them that is riba, in fact that is worse than conventional riba because this is backdoor riba. <laughs> 
differ with us. When we say to them that this paper money is haram and you're supposed to be an Islamic bank and you're using the same paper money, they differ with us. When we say that this fractional reserve banking is haram, they differ with us. And they're supposed to be the model for the whole world of Islam. And our response on the basis of our study of Islamic eschatology, what the Malay called Ilmu al Zaman. We spent a long time on this subject. Here is Jerusalem in the Quran, which qualifies as a textbook in Islamic eschatology. Here is an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, at the heart of Islamic eschatology. Our study of the subject of Islamic eschatology has led us to the conclusion that we now live in a world by divine wisdom and divine planning, in which mankind is offered only two alternatives. <coughs> Either you are faithful to the God of Abraham, who created you from a drop of sperm, and in whose hands is your life, and you follow this last prophet, who takes with him all that the other prophets brought. And he represents, therefore, the entire chain of prophets from Abraham come down. Or, you'll be worshipping Dajjal, the Antichrist. And there's a hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, in which he spoke about Judgment Day, and 999 out of every 1,000 in the hellfire. And so it's not the function of the government of Malaysia or the government of Egypt to define what is Islam, or the newspapers or the television stations. It is for the Qur'an and for Muhammad to tell us what is Islam. And so our response is, mankind must be offered the choice, the freedom to choose. You want to go that way? You want to believe that paper money is fine? It's okay, it's very convenient, put in your wallet. And that the electric, electronic money which is now taking over is also permissible. You want to accept that fractional reserve banking is halal. You want to accept that this uh, Murabaha transaction of Islamic banking is halal. That's your choice. And no one should stop you. No. People must have the freedom to choose. And this is our viewpoint from Islamic scholarship. And we should have the freedom to express ourselves. We say it is because of this that Egypt and Tunisia were taken down to destitution and poverty. And it's a consequence of that riba which was now exploited that you have the Arab Spring. And we say that while it is commendable to stand up against oppression, that there is a hidden agenda at work. It's very convenient for Israel tomorrow when she has to launch her wars which are replanned to be able to point a, a finger in, at Islam and say Islam is re emerging, re-emerging as a menace to the world. But if you come after us, you come after us with boxing gloves, to silence us and to demonize us when we say that this paper money is haram, that this Murabaha, so-called Murabaha transaction is bogus, is fraudulent, is haram, that this fractional reserve banking is haram, that this is the cause of our daughters in Indonesia being slaves now, and society collapsing. If you want to silence us, then our response is, we'll show patience with you for as long as we can. And when we can no longer show patience, we'll say, come, come. And you raise your hands and let us raise our hands and pray to the God of Abraham. To curse with an eternal curse and to punish with eternal punishment 
Whosoever is false on this issue, we hope that we never have to issue that challenge. We hope that they'll never be so foolish as to attempt to silence us. Brothers and sisters, my time is up, but we have the whole of today and we have the whole of tomorrow. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Chairman, you know this is the toughest time. <laughs> so I think, uh, please uh, control your emotions and go to the point. I may accept a couple of questions if you have to raise uh, or if you want to talk to him privately, by all means, if he welcomes your comments and I think knowing him, he will be always there to answer your concerns if uh, genuine. So, first of all, I'd like to have uh, three hands up, two I already seen, one sisters and one brother from Indonesia and one from Egypt. So, three hands are up, but none Malaysians. <laughs> so, let us reserve the Malaysian hands afterwards. And as usual, we know Malaysians always wait and see, and eventually, on the last. <laughs> Put their hands up. So, can I allow these three questions first? And after that, if time permits, we might go second round. Please feel free. Who oh, sisters first? Okay, please. I just go direct to the point. Uh, I'm a bit worried. Uh, you know, those my friends who know me, uh, I'm a little difficult chairman. So, please uh, go straight to the point. Go, go. To the microphone. Please use the microphone there. Uh, maybe someone help. To rotate those microphone cordless, anyone? Have? No, no. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question is uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that uh, He's going to wage war against those who are engaging in riba. So, uh, the current period of uh, the war situation in the world, can that be related to that? And uh, at what stage are we? Uh, it, in the, the charic phase, in the <laughs> like for example, Gog and Magog, because we, we have got droughts, we have got earthquakes, and etc. Et I'm from Maldives. Thank you, sister. Alhamdulillah, we have the Maldives, the most endangered Maldives. world. <laughs> Any time the water level goes up and the country disappears from the sea. So please thank you. And maybe, brother from Indonesia, you can also put your question. Sister from Maldives, mashallah. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Henry Tanjung from Ibn Khaldun University, Bogor, Indonesia. It's a very interesting statement that to lend money to, is to enslave you. Lending money is to enslave you. The big question then arises, how we can stop this process? Because nowadays, all people they are attaching to the bank system, borrowing money. For example, you are buying cars, you are buying houses. What to do then? Thank you. <laughs> Very good. I think, uh, uh, brother, next to you, I think uh, maybe you can go left side. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. For your convenience, yes, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Ali Suleiman. I come from Egypt. I'm an economist. Uh, I just have uh, two or three comments uh, very quickly. One, uh, of course, uh, I enjoyed very much what Honorable Bukhari just, uh, said this morning. He said he was a simple soldier, but I think he gave a very deep definition for us and for this conference uh, that when we talk about Riva, we're not talking about usury alone, but we are also talking about injustice and our a need to create a system that allows free and fair treatment for everybody. Uh, hearing uh, Professor Omran uh, speaks this morning uh, gave me a sense of uh, perhaps danger uh, that we don't want to be totally isolated from the modern economy. I mean, talking back about going back into the economy, going back into the gold standard uh, will uh, generate immediate response. 
by the powers to be in the economic field. And they say barter is not efficient, gold is not a suitable method of exchange. So before we reach that conclusion, we really have to gather our forces as thinkers and economists and offer alternatives and make sure that these alternatives make sense and they are uh, suitable for the modern world. I'm not for uh, paper money or for electronic money per se, but I am for a system that's efficient, that is uh, modern, that is uh, commensurate with the needs of modern uh, world. A final word about suggestion. I think the name of this conference is very good, but we should uh, uh, not say a conference in RIBA, but a uh, conference on RIBA free economy. I think that makes uh, much more sense. I wish you success and thank you. Thank you very much. So we got three questions and three different dimensions for them. Maldives, Indonesia, and Egypt, mashallah. Where are we? What's the time frame? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam spoke about the end of history, which is different from the end of the world. The end of history comes first and then the end of the world. Uh, history ends with the triumph of truth, the triumph of justice, of all rivals. Uh, and the central figure at the end of history is the return of the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Jesus. He gave us signs by which we could recognize that last age. And amongst those signs, there's one which is quite close to us, right here in KL. He said, you'd find the naked, barefooted shepherds competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings. Walk outside, take a look. <laughs> When you see the tall buildings, when you see Manhattan skyscrapers being replicated all over the world, ask yourself, how could that Arab in the desert of Arabia, who never traveled the world, how could he know that a time will come which today has come? He could not have been other than a messenger of Allah, a prophet. So we are in now, we are in that time frame. I wish I had more time to expand on this question, but we have the whole of today and tomorrow. <laughs> Number two, I said that sometimes the money lender lends you to get his pound of flesh. <laughs> But as John Perkins has so brilliantly exposed in his book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the moneylender sometimes lend you to enslave you. He did that in the part of the world from where I come. I come from the Caribbean island of Trinidad, and next door to us is Guatemala and Honduras and Nicaragua and Colombia and Bolivia. And so we know about the latifundia, where the, 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 colo the colonists who came out of Europe needed labor. And you had the Indians, you know you have red Indians, and you have West Indians, like myself. <laughs> uh, so they're, they're called red Indians of, I don't know why they're called, maybe they're reddish in complexion. <laughs> <laughs> These innocent people of South and North and Central America. And they would lend you money on interest knowing that you would not be able to repay because of the rate of interest. And they will then get your labor in lieu of the interest. And when you die, your son will take over. And so they lent you money on interest to enslave you. That's what they did to Africa. And that's what they did to so many other parts of the world. This is why Allah prohibited riba. This is why the Prophet cursed, cursed all four, and said they're all equally guilty. 
the one who gives, the one who takes, the one who records, and the two witnesses. <coughs> and this is why he said that riba is comprised of 70 different parts, the hadith of Ibn Majah. And the smallest part of riba is equivalent to a man marrying his own mother. What more do you want? Is it possible for him to speak language which is harsher than this? Not possible. What do you do when a banking system emerges around the world and a fraudulent monetary system emerges all around the world? If you want to live within the world and be a part of the world, then go ahead. But you cannot be faithful to Allah and follow the Prophet and yet live comfortably in that world out there. Now, this is my answer. You don't have to agree with me. Number three, I remember a conference that took place in Egypt in 1926. July 1926. <laughs> and the conference was organized by Al Azhar University. And there's a book or site entitled The Caliphate. The Hejaz and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state, in which I give a synopsis of that conference. And there was an Egyptian sheikh whose name was Sheikh Muhammad al Zawahiri. <laughs> and he was a profound scholar of law, an eminent Egyptian uh, scholar of law. And the debate was taking place in that conference because the Khilafah had been abolished. What should we do? We need to live in the world, said the Tunisian sheikh. And Zawahiri was sticking to his guns and said, no, I have to be faithful to Allah and to his messenger. And if Allah and his messenger have given me guidance which cannot fit into the world today, then I say goodbye to the world and I go and stay with the truth. This is precisely the situation today where in order to be able to recover the truth my position is that you have to go to the remote countryside and build micro markets and in these micro markets you prevent money lending on interest and in these micro markets you prevent the use of this bogus and fraudulent and haram paper and electronic money. And in these micro markets you bring back the money which is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. And since they are small markets in the countryside, you are more likely, given what Allah has said in Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran, I need not translate it. That Allah will intervene to shower you with his mercy if you choose to remain faithful to him. If you take the countryside, if you take the countryside, then did you study Fidel Castro? Did you study Mao Zedong? If you take the countryside, Tomorrow the countryside will come and take the city. That's what's happening in Turkey today. But you, Zaman Said Nursi, recognized after the abolition of the caliphate. He recognized that he was dealing with Gog and Magad. And Badir Zaman Said Nursi gave the advice to the Turkish people to withdraw to the countryside. He said, build 10,000 Muslim villages. And Islam will be preserved in the villages. Today, the cities of Turkey are eating pork, drinking wine, which is haram in Islam. Maybe halal in China, but not in Islam. Eating pork and drinking wine. But Islam was preserved in the Turkish countryside. And now the countryside is coming back to liberate Constantinople. I think we better we give more time to Brother Imran, because it's not easy to get him. Yes, brother. One more. Uh, 
uh, anymore. So can you please go to the mic? Divine decree? 
is it by accident that this baby which was born and they said all that we are doing is creating a home for a people who don't have a home for they tell monstrous lies and the prophet warned us that in the last day there will be great liars no no they created Israel to one day rule the world. That's why they created Israel. Is it by accident that this baby, which was born just in 1948, has grown thanks to countless Uncle Sam's vetoes in the Security Council, grown to be a nuclear powered thermonuclear powered state in control of the US Congress and with the military capacity to destroy Europe and one step away from taking, out, taking over from the United States once the US dollar collapses and is demonetized and you can then use the US dollar as wallpaper <laughs> and the U.S. economy collapses. It's now a controlled de demolition job that's taking place. And Israel takes over from the United States as the next ruling state. You don't believe me? Wait and see. This is Islamic eschatology. Are these things happening by accident? Or is there an explanation? This is our explanation. That this is coming from Islamic eschatology, this is the work of the Jal, the false messiah. Who is he? I need two hours to answer that, we don't have two hours to answer. <laughs> but read Jerusalem in the Quran, read Jerusalem in the Quran, and you'll see what the Quran says on the subject, and what the Prophet says on the subject. Most people are not interested today in these things. Uh, Electronic money is cheaper than paper currency. <laughs> With paper currency, you've got to have a printing press, you've got to have pay for your need ink. <laughs> and then you need the trucks to transport, and you need Wells Fargo to protect the trucks and so on. And you create wells out of nothing. But with electronic money, you just type it in and you type it out. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever controls the keyboard, no government will control the keyboard tomorrow. No. No central bank. Is the banking system controlled by the Euro, Jewish, and Euro Christian? Zionist Alliance. I'm using my words with great care. <laughs> because there are Jews who oppose Israel. And there are Jews who stand with us in seeking to liberate the Palestinian people from oppression. And there are Christians like that as well. They are the ones who control electronic money or digital money. And the nice thing about it is that uh, while you're here in Malaysia, you would eat something called roti chanai <laughs> for breakfast. Drink something called te tare. If you won't be able to buy even your newspaper without they being able to track you down. They know how much money you have. They know how you are spending your money. And they know where you go when you bought the newspaper. The Jal is a genius, absolute genius. So the electronic money functions also as a very sophisticated system of espionage. The Rora. The law in Islam permits you to eat pork when there is no food. But that does not mean that the pork is not haram. 
the pork still remains haram. If there is no food to eat, and you are starving to death, then the divine wisdom allows you darura, the doctrine of necessity. So you can eat pork, so long as there is no food. In the United States, when I lived there, they apply the doctrine of darura to buy a house. So when I looked at the house, I said to myself, well, why did you have to fill your plate, plate with pork? Look at the size of that house. Hmm? And secondly, when you're eating the pork, you must still detest it. But well, why are you licking your fingers? <laughs> Sending emails back to Pakistan, look at the lovely house I now have. <laughs> and number three, number three, you must only eat the pork for the minimum time possible while you're searching for food. So how come you sign the document for 40 years of pork? <laughs> application of the doctrine of the Rora. Okay, just a Thank you very much. I think we are running out of time. <laughs> Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu Tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup Sanera kamu dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku ampunkanlah dosaku sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa dosa besar. Allah fahab li ta'ala 